Over the next 45, 50 minutes or so, as I'm up here speaking, if I say something that generates a question in your mind, or if I say something that you would like me to expand on, or if I say something that you would like to offer a comment on, I would ask you, please, please commit that to memory, or, or if you have the opportunity, write it down on a piece of paper, for it is my intention to open it up for some questions when I've done it. We'll have a couple of people that have mics out in the audience, so please keep that in mind while I'm speaking. I would ask you all, please take a close look at this face. This is the face of a college graduate. This is a face, as Rich just told you, of a college graduate who earned both of his degrees with the highest academic honors available. This is the face of a kind man, an honest man, a trustworthy man, a man of his word. Please take a look at this face. Now look at this face. This is a face of a man who on March 20th, 1992, walked into the first tier National Bank, brandished a semi-automatic pistol, and demanded all the 20s, 50s, and 100s. This would be the first of five armed bank robberies I would commit over a six-month crime spree when I was 28 years old. Please take a look at this face. Both these faces are mine. The transformation between the two, the transformation from a suicidal, drug-induced bank robber to what you see standing before you today took place gradually over seven and one-half years within the confines of a federal penitentiary. The awakening, what I quote call the awakening, the time in my life where I decided I had to get off of that train I had been riding the last 15 years, the time in my life where I decided I could not keep doing things the way I had been doing them, this quote awakening took place about six months into my incarceration, and it was fueled by three things. The first thing that fueled this awakening of mine is the dead time in prison. It literally hangs in the air. I would sit in common areas and I would watch guys play cards, play dominoes, and watch TV for 12, 14, 16 hours a day, day after day, week after week, month after month, year after year. Some of these guys doing this for 5, 10, 15 years at a time. I would look at this and I'd think to myself, is this how you guys are going to make a living when you get out of here? I couldn't fathom spending all that time in that fashion. And the second thing that fueled this awakening in mind was, of course, my son. I discovered not only was it possible, not only was it possible, but that I had the responsibility to influence my far-off son in a positive way. And the third thing that fueled this awakening in mind is something that my dad used to say when I was a kid growing up, something I lost track of during my teens and early 20s, but something that I came to believe in and rely on during those years of incarceration. And what my dad used to say is this, anything in this life which is worthwhile, which is really, really worthwhile, is never easy. And you see, I had always taken the easy road. The easy road is the drug use, the lying, the stealing, the cheating. Anybody can do those things. It doesn't take a special individual, man, woman, boy, or girl to do those things. Anyone can do those things. That's the easy road. The more difficult road is a road of self-respect, a road of believing in yourself, a road of oftentimes standing over here when it seems like you're all alone and everybody else is going in a different direction or doing something else, but knowing in your head and in your heart what you're doing is the right thing, that's oftentimes a more difficult road. But that's the road to a bright future, that's the road to prosperity, that's the road to success. So I have this awakening, right? For me it's going to be education. Education is what I'm going to sink my teeth into. Education is going to be the means in which I take a very negative situation and make it as positive as I possibly can. But just because I have this grand idea on this grand scale, I still have only the obstacles prison can put before you. So these gang members, right? I've had several altercations with them. Up to this point, I'm telling them I'm not going to do it. They don't care that it can mean more time for me. They don't care that it can mean incarceration for my family or my friends. But the day finally comes where I have to make a decision. Three of them come in on me in my cell, and they're carrying with them what they kill each other with in prison. The first one's carrying one of these, a toothbrush, a simple everyday toothbrush. They take one end of it and they file it down on the concrete to a sharp point, and the, large, the other end they wrap in duct tape to use as a handle. That's what the first one's carrying. The second one is carrying one of these a pork chop bone. Looks pretty harmless on your plate at the end of a meal, but again, they take the long part of the bone and they file it down on the concrete to a sharp point, and the large part of the bone fits nicely into the palm of your hand. They come up behind one another and they stab each other in the artery of the neck with these. That's what the second one's carrying. And the third one is carrying one of these. 
a 16-penny nail driven through a piece of a broom handle. So these three guys come into my cell, they're carrying these things, and they tell me, it's time to make a decision, Evans, are you going to do this or aren't you? Was I scared? Yeah, I was scared. I was terrified. The first thing that came to my mind is, I'll do it. I'll do whatever you say. Just please, please put those things away. But then something stronger than my fear overcame me. I thought about my son and how he was committed to me no matter where I was. And I thought about my family and how I had always sacrificed them, how I had always put myself first and them second. And I don't know where the strength came from, because I can tell you I didn't feel very strong at that moment, but from somewhere inside of me came the words, I'm not going to do it. You're going to have to do what you came to do. What happened next? Well, I believe, as a matter of fact, I know things happen for a reason. A jingle of keys can be heard coming down the corridor, a guard's on his way. When they hear this, they take their shanks and they throw them underneath my mattress. You're only allowed to have two inmates in a cell at a time, so when he gets to my cell and he sees these guys in there, he sticks his head in and he says, Evans, what are these guys doing in here? I said, they're not doing anything. We're just visiting. They're not doing a thing. He orders them out. Five minutes later, I gathered up their shanks and I took them back to him one at a time and I handed them to him and I said, I think you guys forgot something. They never bothered me again. Whether it was because I didn't tell the guard what they were doing in my cell that day or whether it was because they could see in my eye that I was no longer going to take that easy road, that they were going to have to do what they came to do that day, whatever the reason, I was never bothered again. One week after the day I was called down to my counselor's office, I got a letter from that association and a check for one class, one single class. I took that class and I mailed them my report card. They sent me a check for two classes. I again took those two classes and I mailed them my report card and it snowballed to the point where they were funding entire semesters. And the end result of that association's help was me walking out those doors of prison with two college degrees both earned with a 4.0 GPA and placement on the deans and presidents list. Thank you. Thank you. And then the only thing that could have made that situation any worse happens. They tell me they're transferring me to FCI Inglewood, the oldest, nastiest prison within the Federal Bureau of Prisons built in 1939. It looks like something out of a medieval movie. When I get to FCI Inglewood, I discover that the conditions are even worse because one of the housing units is closed down for asbestos removal. When I get to the housing unit that I'm assigned to, I discover within this housing unit is a common area called a pod. And in this pod that 150 guys share, it's probably about twice the size of this stage I'm standing on, in this common area that 150 guys share are four toilets, four sinks, three showers, and a microwave oven. And don't think that there's stalls between any of these things. Everything, I mean everything's done out in the wide open. So you got guys taking a shower here, guys using the bathroom here, guys brushing their teeth here, and guys lined up to heat up food in a microwave oven. Picture all those different activities taking place out in the wide open. So I get to this place, I'm looking at these conditions, and I'm thinking to myself, there's no way I can spend the next five years here. Again, I'm thinking, why is this happening to me? All I'm trying to do is earn a degree. All I'm trying to do is give myself a chance to succeed when I'm released. Why is this happening to me? Well, things do happen for a reason. I'm at FCI Inglewood for less than three weeks when I hear my name over the intercom. Evans number 24291-013, report to the records office immediately. I go down to the records office and the lady tells me, shut the door and sit down. I would later discover that FCI Inglewood is the only institution in the entire Federal Bureau of Prisons, over 200 institutions nationwide, the only one in this entire country that has this policy. They automatically review the sentence computation of everybody who's transferred into their facility via another facility. She tells me, shut the door and sit down. I just got off the phone with the regional office. We went over your sentence computation. There's been a mistake. You should not have been sentenced to 13 years. You should have only been sentenced to eight. You're going home in 10 days. 